Jen, it's Suzanne. Just calling to see if you're going to that special PTA meeting tonight. I, I wasn't planning to go, but Rachel Carpenter said the school is changing the test next spring. It's something about a, a common core standards. Hey, Steve. I don't know. Josh here. Just, just really surprised because I wanted I've to never see if you heard, heard anything about the um, any, anyway, common core standards. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Before the fall of 2012, very little was known about the common core. The media wasn't covering it. It wasn't a part of the national discourse. It wasn't even on parents' radars. But by January 2013, questions started rolling in. Parents were confused. What is the Common Core? Who does it affect? When did their state, their school district, adopt this new reform? But most importantly, why hadn't they heard about it until now? First of all, viewers should go and look at the standards. Uh, they're public. And I think the best argument for this Common Core are the standards themselves. They're very good. And you go and you read them, and, and some critics, or former critics, have come in and they've looked at the standards and they walk away very impressed. So I think the best argument is to go and read them for yourself and to make your own informed decision. In terms of standards, the state-led Common Core State Standards Initiative is developing clear, rigorous standards that will match the best in the world. Common Core says it is research-based, internationally benchmarked, and you have these boards of education members who were certainly, as I said earlier, motivated well, well-intentioned, they're educated people, whether they're appointed or elected, and they believe this. They believe that the standards are rigorous even though they can't tell you what makes for a rigorous or a non-rigorous standards. They simply don't know how to read a set of standards. And this is part of the basic problem. For the Common Core standards has been a very long time in the making. The need has become increasingly clear. As the United States becomes increasingly mobile, it no longer made sense to have 50 sets of standards. It has become increasingly important for American students to be prepared to compete with students around the globe. And we worked to create a program initiative called ACHIEVE. It set national standards in a couple of subjects, grammar and math. Now the program eventually evolved into what is known as Common Core, adopted in 2010. It is a shift about standards, it's a shift about assessment, because it means they will be equally measured, and it's finally a shift about curriculum. Well, it sounds good. So why is there growing opposition in Ohio and around the country to Common Core? Sadly, the very label Common Core has come to be associated with things that I detest. From Common Core... As parents, to we want state high standards. And we want accountable Columbia schools. Columbia. But the problem is, well, this goes well beyond that. These standards aren't rigorous, just different. Designed for an industrial model of school. And a guy by the name of Robert Small, he was arrested last week at a school board meeting. Oh. Stand for this. Right? You're sitting here like cattle. Questioning the school's hotly debated Common Core curriculum. They did try, I think, to cloak some of the activities uh, from the public at large. For example, the development of the Common Core uh, drafts, you would think there would be a public hearing. You would think that public comment would be everywhere. I mean, when we developed our standards in Massachusetts, it took us years because we debated texts, we debated what's going to go into the U.S. history standards, and it was all publicly debated, public hearings, a testimony taken. None of that really happened here. There was some public comment, very truncated uh, lists of things came out saying, well, this is the kind of comments we got. There was no clear response to those comments. This is the kind of thing that makes me worry, right? The states got to look at early drafts and they got to weigh in on those drafts. And those comments were very much taken as a part of the process of developing those standards. 
Drafts were also put out for public comment, and I think they received something like 10,000 comments from the public on those standards. So the development of these standards was very much a public process, and it was something that was very much uh, involved the states, both at a political level, but also at a substantive level. State-led, common core, state standards initiative is developing clear, rigorous standards that will match the best in the world. Last month, 46 governors and chief state school officers made a public commitment to embrace those standards. And there are a lot of people that believe that somehow that this is uh, a takeover, a national takeover of, of uh, what is the domain of local and, and uh, state governments as it relates to setting expectations. But in fact, these are 45 states that have voluntarily come together to create fewer, higher, deeper standards that when you benchmark them to the best in the world, they're world class. And I'm for that. The Common Core is a project of two organizations in Washington, D.C., Council for Chief State School Officers and the National Governors Association. So when you hear NGA and CCSSO did it, what Common Core supporters will say is, see, this shows states are doing it. Is the Common Core more top-down than the states were already doing by setting their own academic standards? Um, I don't think so. I, a group of states got together, set these in common. And that assumes that what the NGA and CCSSO do reflects the will of people in states. That is an extremely tenuous uh, assertion. You know, first of all, that assumes that when I vote for governor of my state, one of the things I'm thinking of is, what's he going to do in the National Governors Association? You know, what's, what's really interesting about the Common Core in terms of its genesis is we see the same players who were working on this in the 1990s working on it again. You have some of the bit players, like Checker Finn from Fordham has been around it, uh, pushing for this stuff, but the people have really played a larger role with people like Mark Tucker, who was, uh, became famous with his Dear Hillary letter, a 17-page letter that described to Hillary how we could transform American education to something that more approximated the German system, which focused on workforce development with great databases that would allow us to pinpoint where we should push kids. Achieve Incorporated. Achieve Incorporated has worked with states for a long time in trying to develop cross-state uh, collaborations, which is a good thing, right? If Massachusetts wants to collaborate with Connecticut, absolutely for it. Um, but they took a, a larger role here trying to push the idea of creating a common core set of standards. And they were funded by the Gates Foundation at a very high clip, uh, as was uh, Fordham. So if you go back and you look at the history of where the Common Core came from, you'll see that, first of all, it started with groups like ours and some others like the Hunt Institute, uh, former Governor Jim Hunt, uh, making this case that we needed to have higher standards and that common standards might be one way to get there. The idea was we would provide political cover for governors and for state superintendents to set the bar as high as it needed to be set. And the thinking was that what was happening before was there was all this political pressure to keep the bar low. The people who worked on these initiatives in the past, in the George H.W. Bush administration and in the Bill Clinton administration, discovered that it was unpopular to have the federal government do this. So Governor Romer of Colorado and former Governor Hunt both came to the conclusion that in order to do this, they had to get the origin. They needed a kind of an immaculate conception of these standards. And what was the Race to the Top program? Oh, so the Race to the Top program was a competitive grant program that was part of President Obama's stimulus package. So it was $4.35 billion and it was a portion the states could apply, and they had to prove that they were sort of doing a lot of the um, 
reforms that the Obama administration supported. So things like revamping teacher evaluation, increasing the number of charter schools, and changing their standards. So adopting uh, Common Core or Common Core-like standards uh, what played a very large role in that. Yeah, so the federal government played uh, a very powerful role in incentivizing states to, to adopt the Common Core standards. Today we crossed an important threshold in education reform. Today we're announcing the draft guidelines for states to apply for the $4.35 billion Race to the Top Fund. Arne Duncan basically, as the Secretary of Education, uh, went to each state and said that each state has uh, a couple of months basically to write a grant to uh, become eligible for federal funding under the stimulus package, federal grant funding. And this was a time when austerity had hit hard in the wake of the Great Recession of 2008-2009. So a lot of states were desperate for funding. So without any real deliberate process, these states wrote the grants, got the really influential signatures on the grants. Now when they signed off on the grants, they signed off on the race to the top mandates. I'm trying to think of something analogous to this that slipped through so easily on a national basis, and I really can't. That's why I called it radical. You know, it's a real change from the past. My name, first of all, is Sandra Stotsky, and I was the Senior Associate Commissioner in the Massachusetts Department of Education between 1999 to 2003, where I was in charge of the development or revision of all of our K-12 standards in all major subjects. I've been a full professor at, at Stanford for almost 45 years and of relevance to a discussion of Common Core, let me add that I was on the Common Core Validation Committee. I was the, the person on validation who was directly responsible for overseeing the mathematical core standards for proceeding and their writing and the quality of them. We had to sign a confidentiality agreement that we would not ever discuss what took place in the meeting itself. This, of course, is very different from all the other civic committees I've ever been in, which were subject, subjected to sunshine laws. A number of the people that, that, that led the, the writing projects for both of these are now in very high positions. For example, one of them is the head of the college board, which controls a, a whole group of exams. Um, and uh, these people have not been very forthcoming. They've been very careful in what they say, and uh, I don't think they've given, you, given the, po the, the public any real idea of what's actually going on. We were expected to say, apparently, that these standards were internationally benchmarked, they followed procedures that were appropriate, a few other things, and I couldn't do that. Then, about two weeks later, I discovered there was a report on the Validation Committee on the website for Common Core. It simply listed the members who were on the committee, and then it listed the names of people who signed on. But when I counted up the number of names, we were missing five, so that's when I figured out who, that there were five people who had not signed on. Five out of 30 is a very large number considering the fact that, that we were under enormous political pressure to actually sign on. Numbers you just mentioned tell a clear story, which is why the nation's governors adopted the Common Core curriculum. This new, tougher, more demanding standard of learning is generating a lot of buzz in this. And we kind of expected that there would be something like a minority report or there would be some acknowledgement of the existence of this dissent. And no, there was not. The, the five people who, di who didn't uh, agree to sign the letter simply were expunged from the record. And so it was possible for people in the education world to say that 
everybody approved of core standards and indeed they are benchmarked at international standards and so on. When a child walks into a classroom, it should be a place of high expectations and high performance. But too many schools don't meet this test. That's why instead of just pouring money into a system that's not working, we launched a competition called Race to the Top. To all 50 states, we said, if you show us the most innovative plans to improve teacher quality and student achievement, we'll show you the money. The biggest misconception that Common Core proponents push on people is that there is any evidence that a system like Common Core will benefit children. We have no track record. We have, and the track record we have is, is points against Common Core. And then people who know about academic uh, content, academic quality, um, you know, are telling us that Common Core is of poor quality. Now, I have a lot of respect for professors Milgram and Stotsky. Uh, but their views are very much in the minority, and not just among scholars, but even among those of us who really care about a rigorous, fairly traditional, fairly conservative approach to teaching English and math. Uh, and both of them have admitted publicly that the Common Core standards are better, vastly better, than the, than the vast majority of state standards that were in place. When I talk about core standards with most states, I have to say, you know, as bad as Core Standards is, it's better than your standards. I think Common Core is more damaging than beneficial in English language arts. We didn't even get to the question of its 50-50 divide of, between informational texts and literary texts. It's removing literary, uh, diminishing literary study in the English curriculum, which is what English teachers are trained to teach. I think that professors Milgram and Stotsky are making the perfect be the enemy of the good. All right, we believe the Common Core standards are very solid. We don't think they're perfect. We gave them an A minus in math, a B plus in English. There were some parts of it that we would have liked to have improved. But you have to understand that the state standards they are replacing, by and large, were terrible. So why wouldn't we want to at least raise the standards for 90% of the states? And then maybe down the road, in a few years, we can do something else that even you know, furthers that improvement. How much time do you think we have? I don't know, it's hard for me to estimate. I was thinking initially when I started in on this weird odyssey into education, I was thinking, I know there's a, a catastrophe coming on the horizon. This is not your ordinary run-of-the-mill recession. We are going through the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. But I also was pretty confident that it was going to be after I was gone. Not anymore. Hidden under the table in the request for proposals for the race to the top money, that four and a half billion dollars the government is, is using as seed money to encourage the adoption of Common Core, is a series of requirements that in order to apply for this money, the presidents of the public universities in each state that applies have to sign a letter agreeing that if a student comes to the university, or college as the case may be, from high school, having passed a standardized exam in the content of the, the, the basic course Algebra II, it is not permitted in this, specifically not permitted, to put them in remedial courses. Everything will align private schools, including charter schools, because they want to get their kids to college. Suddenly, it used to be that ACT could do what the colleges demanded for it. Suddenly, now ACT is going to do, it's actually done already, what the K-12 system demands of it. Same with SAT. Currently today, over 40% of the students in this country have to take remedial courses in mathematics. And what they're saying, in effect, is that we can't remediate, we have to give them credit-bearing courses. The long-term effect of that is simply that the credit-bearing courses will, will drop in, in content to the point where they fit to what we're getting out of K-12. 
And that's a severe, what the educators call dumbing down of, of a system that is the only system that is, is giving us uh, the economic, the long-term economic support that we require. Um, the, the definition of college readiness, I think it's a fair critique that it's a minimal definition of college readiness. For and, some colleges. Well, for, for the colleges most kids go to, but not that most parents probably aspire, right? The, it's not for STEM. It's not for international That's true. It's not, for, it's not only not for I mean, STEM, it's also easy. not for selective colleges that, for example, UC Berkeley, even whether you're going to be an engineer or not, You'd better have pre-calculus right. to get but into But we UC have to Berkeley, think of our right? engineering colleges. And that's, scientific that's true. I think the Jason Zimba's verbatim testimony uh, to the March meeting of the Massachusetts Board of Education is as smoking a gun as you're going to get. What Zimba is saying, finally and clearly, is this background is barely enough to get a student into a non-selective college or a community college, but everybody gets into a community college, uh, and it is not enough to get into STEM, but more than STEM, it's not even enough to get into a selective university. You're touching precisely on the weak spot of the common core. Nobody knows if there is such a thing as being at the same time college of career ready. Maybe there are two separate goals. Nobody knows. In fact, the National Assessment Governing Board tried to answer this question around 2008 and there was a big technical panel studying this exact question, whether there is a possibility of having a single test showing whether a student is both prepared for career and for college. They came back and they said, there is no research about it, we are not sure, we need to study it. Half a year later, the Common Core came along and declared by fiat, without any substanti substantiation, oh, Yes, we can do it, and here they are. So they put a stake in the ground, supposedly the goalpost for all high school students in America. And they call this goalpost was career and college ready. Now let's be serious. If 100% of students can be college ready, and it obviously politically cannot fail half of them or a quarter of them or a two thirds of them, whatever it will happen, it cannot be real college readiness. It has to be a low-level college readiness. On the other hand, if it will be too low level, people will complain. It will be too obvious, so they have to put it high. Suddenly, the career readiness becomes too demanding. So some people will complain it's too low for college readiness, and they're right. It, too, it is too low because otherwise half of the cohort will fail. Other people will complain it's too high for the career readiness, and they're right. It is too high to for career readiness because otherwise the college readiness will look ridiculous on its face. It's an untenable position. It's a change of the way we used to run our lives, you know, our society. Some kids wanted to go to college and they took the college prep classes in high school and they would go to SAT or ACT or whatever other test they did, IB, AP, and they would be college ready. They will prepare for college. Other children did not. And they would fill up later if they're late bloomer, that's fine. But declaring by fear that everybody will be career and college ready looks like an untenable goal, and that's exactly what you see, this schism. Well, is it too high? Is it too low? Does it make sense? The truth is it makes no sense. So that's it. I had about an hour phone conversation with David Coleman. He asked to talk to me about the Common Core and I was happy to listen to him. And there were some ideas in there that if I was running a public school system, I would think were basically a good idea. But what I, I did say to him is that, um, you know, the difference between his approach to education and my approach to education is he thinks he has some good ideas about how to do education. And I think, in the homeschooling world, I have some good ideas about how to do education. The difference is, he's trying to use the force of law to require everybody to implement his good ideas. The central planning is simply people who like power, who think they're an elite who knows how to run other people's lives. And I grew up differently. I grew up in a small town in Massachusetts that had an open town meeting. And I loved it. The idea that you have 
independent citizens who choose for themselves how to govern themselves. That was Lincoln's idea. That was what he was fighting for. How to make sure that self-government as a concept endured because he, the Union had to endure. That was what was the great idea that came out of the Constitution and that Lincoln was impressed by. It was the first country that was really based on that premise, that people were capable of governing themselves. They didn't need a monarch. They didn't need a dictator. They didn't need central planners. It's a hugely powerful idea. And we've almost lost sight of it. Twenty-two percent of ninth graders do not finish high school. That's one out of five. The more we have these stringent common core requirements, we're going to have more people walking around without a high school diploma. Texas has opted out of the common core. And you know, I'm going to tip my hat to Texas. In Texas, you have alternative high school degrees. You can have one high school degree that really preps you with four years of math and everything for University of Texas, Southern Methodist, you know, and so on. You can have a regular college, semi-college uh, diploma. And then a third diploma is a kind of general diploma. Obama administration, Duncan, they don't like that approach because it leaves things up to kids' choices. They want a centralized system in which things are directed by people like them who think they know better for what's good for other people's children. But alternate high schools are what other industrialized countries have always used. Little Finland, for example, over 50% of their kids choose to go to Voc Tech high schools. Less than 50% go to their academic high schools, and they have about eight different tracks in their academic high schools. But most countries see that as a way to capture adolescent motivation. To have one standard for all is a total dead end, you know? And, to a, and it's also stereotyping people that everybody will go to college, and everybody wants the same kind of career, and everybody has the same abilities and interests, and you're not worthwhile if you don't do this. This is crazy. If you have a lot of local control, people can experiment, try out and to see which one is better. So this whole concept of laboratories of democracy, laboratories of education, you basically stifle this. But then there is a second aspect, which has to do with whose child is it? Is it the government right to teach the child what the government thinks the child should know? Or is it my child and I should have some say in it? My real concern I know this sounds trite, it's been said in so many ways, is that McGraw-Hill, Pearson, Gates really regard education as a production line in which they're going to take little human beings and make them college or career ready. Come on now, they're human beings. There's more than college and career. Well, I think the purpose of education is for uh, a person to discover what they're talented at, uh, to discover who they are, to grow it as an individual and as someone who can think, uh, to create someone who's articulate, someone who could be a lifelong learner, someone who could be successful in life. And that means communicating, it means learning, it means passion, being passionate about what you've decided to do and discovering what you've decided to do. Uh, I think current policymakers, unfortunately, see the purpose of education as being uh, training people to acquire the minimum level of skills that are required to work in a technical workplace. 
to compete in a world uh, that's incredibly competitive, where people are very aggressive in seeking competitive advantages. We have to play this game as well and, and win. But identifying common standards is just the starting point. We'll only know if this effort has succeeded when the curriculum and tests are aligned to these standards. They have to teach to the standards or the kids won't get the right scores. And the right scores is not the point here. They're trying to quantify everything and this will make it all right. We'll be a brilliant nation. No, we'll be a nation where nobody's brilliant. Every person has a different talent, a different ability, different interests. These are living, breathing people. Every prominent person in this nation in politics, in government, in entertainment, in law, followed a passion and was brilliant for something. They weren't all mushed out to be the same. And once again, some of the most famous, richest people in this country were terrible students with terrible test scores who struggled through school. But that wasn't the be all and the end all of their lives or their judgments about them. In the core standards, there's a shift, as we talked about, in that not only ELA teachers, but also historians and scientists are equally working with students to develop their ability to read and write. But in the ELA classroom, which often has had domain over stories, drama, and poetry, the typical areas of literature, a new kind of text is entering for the ELA teacher. It's very exciting for them. David Coleman was a nice man. He, he treated me well. It was a cordial conversation. It was very professional. Um, I, I don't agree with his approach at all. Uh, I, I, I don't agree with his philosophy. I think that on balance his proposals are not for the good of the public schools. Um, they certainly aren't good for home schools or private schools, but you know, I, I, I have some cri criticism there. But the man's motives, I, I don't think we should be attacking people for their motives because he wants to try to improve the public school system. He genuinely believes that systemization and centralization and data collection are good things for kids. I think it's a genuine attempt on the part of the authors to produce something which outlines the mathematics that students have to know. The trouble is, you can't do something this radical where you're cutting out chunks of the mathematics we've done traditionally for well over 100 years without having some research that says how it will work. And there isn't such research right now. It sure is an experiment. Why? Because it's national. Hey, we've got a national test called this SAT, you know, Scholastic Assessment Test, or ACT, American College Test. Those are national, but those are voluntary. You know. But this is to be you know, compulsory. Somehow, all I hear now is we've got to keep up with China or we have to win the race. What race? The race is to keep the democracy alive and vibrant and safe and to have thinking, caring, intelligent students. At the end of the day, you really have to decide this. Is education about my child and my children or is it about the system? I always liked William Buckley's remark years ago, I'd rather be governed by the first hundred names in the telephone directory than a hundred faculty at Harvard. In other words, the common person has better common sense than a hundred faculty at members at Harvard. So this is what self-government is about. You don't elect monarchs or Plato's philosophical elite. You listen to each other's point of view and you rationally work your way through. But we don't have people who want to articulate that at the top level. And common core is just the opening wedge. It sounds innocuous, it sounds good. Why shouldn't we have you know, the same math standards in every single state? But then it turns out that at the high school level, they're about two grades lower. This is a highly diverse nation. We have people growing up in the heart of big cities, people who will never be in a big city, people on farms, people on uh, reservations, um, people whose whole lives will be spent in agriculture, uh, people who really don't want to go to college, uh, people who don't need to go to college, 
We have uh, kids who come to school at the age of four and a half or five, never having seen an orange or a rabbit. They really don't know their own names. And their childhoods have been total tumult. And the waffle plate is being put over them and they're supposed to learn. I especially love the fact that districts, mine included in St. Louis, are being punished because the kids don't come in and keep up. And a friend of mine as a teacher has said, I don't get it. If they're all getting the same lessons, why aren't they all making the top standardized scores? No matter what their childhoods were. I didn't, I couldn't answer. I was so dumbfounded. Because they're not apples, they're people. They're not going to come, they're going to not know how to focus, half the vocabulary, how to respond to an adult, ever being addressed directly, ever having a meaningful conversation. They're scared and you're worried about your test standards.